among my teachers were several Austrian school professors who I had enormous respect for. And one of the things I learned from them uh, was to always be mindful of uh, unintended consequences, right? So economists talk about the law of unintended consequences. And I have to say that I think that is a very sharp idea. You know, if I was in charge of anything, I would want somebody next to me saying, you know, if you do that, this might happen and things might turn out, not turn out the way you expect them to. I'm Gary Monjovi. I teach economics at uh, St. John's University in Queens, New York. Keynes is, is normally understood as someone who was trying to uh, rescue capitalism from its own dysfunctions. As I think about his work, it seems to me that, in fact, he had a much more comprehensive and radical vision of uh, how society should be organized. Uh, he understood that the creation of a good society uh, required uh, uh, much more involvement uh, by the state in organizing and designing institutions that would generate good outcomes for the vast majority of people. And for him, that meant democratic socialism. He didn't expl explicitly use that term, but uh, when you go through all of his writings, uh, that is uh, the picture that he paints, one in which uh, uh, people participate in uh, uh, governance and uh, participate in conversations about uh, how, how institutions should be designed so that they produce uh, generalized, broad-based well-being. This is an idea that has uh, recently been developed in a book by James Crotty called Keynes Against Capitalism, which I think is an out outstanding book. And it really opened my eyes to, uh, 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 to understanding that, that Keynes's vision was uh, much more radical than is sometimes thought. Mainstream economics is, is often thought of as uh, reactionary uh, and anti-labor. And I think that misunderstands, uh, certainly it misunderstands its origins. The theory of supply and demand, which we typically associate with uh, orthodoxy and mainstream economics, it is economics. Uh, for most people, uh, originated in the uh, 1870s and really didn't get traction, didn't become the dominant mode of economic analysis until the early 1900s and the 1920s. And the founders of that branch, of that, that new departure, were in some degree uh, fairly progressive. They wanted a set of tools that could help society cope with the problems that were being raised by increasing industrial, industrialization. You know, problems of urbanization, problem of monopoly power and the regulation of monopoly, uh, problems connected to uh, public health and taxation in order to, you know, cope with all of these various problems, uh, problems connected to labor unrest. And one of the reasons, I think, for the success of neoclassical economics was that it provided a, a useful set of tools. It was a nice toolkit for coping with those problems for uh, uh, a good part of the first half of the 20th century. I think it hit a brick wall with the Great Depression. Uh, but I think it also was a departure from earlier theories that we associate with uh, Adam Smith, David Ricardo, and I think in that same line, uh, Karl Marx. And the big distinction between these two approaches, the approaches of the classical economist and Marx and neoclassical supply and demand theory, has to do with the way they explained income distribution. And uh, modern theory sees income distribution as fundamentally regulated by the forces of supply and demand, with the demand for labor uh, being grounded in the productivity of labor, right? So that in an equilibrium outcome, the position of central tendency of the system, uh, 
wages reflect the contribution of labor to, uh, to output. The classical economists and Marx never had that presumption. They saw the distribution of income as regulated by uh, uh, the subsistence needs of workers plus the uh, uh, historically contingent institutional setting uh, plus a tug of war between workers and capitalists. Uh, they also were open-ended about what regulates demand. They never understood the demand for commodities as being regulated by explainable in terms of price elastic demand functions. You know, uh, uh, they would have explained that in terms of uh, historical patterns of consumption, uh, societal norms, uh, uh, group norms, and, and so forth. The prices of things for them were not determined by the, uh, the interaction of the forces of supply and demand. They were determined by the cost of production, which seems to me to be a much more adequate and intuitive and sensible way of understanding why the price of a new car might be $60,000 and the price of this shirt might be $40 and not the other way around. So that opens up a whole uh, a range of uh, alternative ways of understanding what goes on in the world. Um, marketing people, for example, uh, don't fuss too much about demand curves. They understand that what regulates spending patterns uh, is much more nuanced, much more sociologically complex than that. I think that neoliberalism's greatest ideological triumph was convincing the vast majority of people that the way capitalism worked in the golden age, the quarter of a century that immediately followed the Second World War, is the way it normally works. Um, in fact, uh, that golden age era, as it is sometimes uh, described, uh, was an aberration. That's why we refer to it as a golden age. And I, I need to point out uh, that that golden age bestowed most of its benefits on white males and their families. So that, that needs to be said. But that, that golden age was partly driven by massive amounts of public spending and public investment, uh, partly in reaction to the, the Cold War. You know, the interstate highway system was justified on grounds of uh, needing to move materiel in case there was a confrontation with uh, the Soviet Union uh, or Mao's China. Uh, there was massive amounts of investment in education to train sociologists, anthropologists, political scientists who would be useful in uh, projecting U.S. He hegemony uh, uh, across a world that was in conflict. So as a result of that, you, you get a situation in which the economy is generating high rates of growth, uh, high productivity, uh, growth, high profits, um, and because there was a strong union movement, right, there's 30 percent of the, the U.S. workforce was unionized, uh, the workers are sharing in uh, the benefits of productivity growth. So you have uh, a situation in which the system is generating broad-based uh, prosperity, uh, but uh, that period eventually petered out in the, uh, the 1970s for a variety of reasons. Uh, one, there was uh, uh, competition in manufacturing from lower cost, less developed uh, economies. Uh, there was uh, an oil embargo generated by uh, uh, OPEC. That gave rise to uh, a period of stagflation, which was not uh, beneficial to Keynesian modes of analysis. It put Keynesian economics on the back foot. Um, and eventually, uh, mainstream Keynesianism got displaced by a neoliberal outlook, uh, which saw uh, the market as knowing best and the best thing that the state could do to generate well-being.
uh, would be to get out of the way of the market. And you had that kind of a mentality uh, take root, and it has, to a large extent, dominated since the early 1980s. You, you have episodes in which uh, there's a backing away from that, as in after the 2007 global financial crisis uh, and the need to stimulate the economy. And then, of course, uh, the COVID pandemic also uh, led to a, a recognition that uh, the state needs to play a role in uh, ensuring uh, economic well-being. Marx made a distinction between what he called vulgar economics and uh, classical political economy. And the distinction had to do with whether uh, the uh, discourse was genuinely scientific, genuinely taking account of uh, uh, reality in a uh, systematic and, and measured way uh, versus an, an approach that was simply a form of ideology masquerading as science. Uh, vulgar economics is uh, the latter. It's uh, ideology masquerading as science. It looks at superficialities. It doesn't look beneath the surface. And a good example, right, just a uh, you know, very basic kind of example, is supply and demand theory, which Marx regarded as vulgar, right? The idea that uh, if the amount demanded of a good exceeds the amount of it available, uh, the price of that good will rise. That is a very superficial observation about uh, how, what happens in markets. It's obviously true. Uh, you don't need scientific analysis to make that determination. And Marx, in fact, said that if uh, everything was as it appeared on the surface, uh, there would be no need for science. Well, I think that uh, my current research project has to do with uh, looking at the, the work of James Buchanan and the Virginia School of Political Economy and trying to understand it as a form of uh, vulgar uh, economics. Uh, it starts from a very simple idea, and that is the idea that People who work in government are no different from the rest of us. They are partly motivated by self-interest. Uh, and that motivation uh, in self-interest uh, leads them to uh, uh, manage the affairs of, of government in ways that are uh, wasteful, inefficient, and detrimental to, uh, to the rest of us. And the fact that uh, we have a government that is uh, proactive in many ways, right? We have all of these agencies that are responsible for public health or regulating markets and so forth, uh, creates opportunities for what Buchanan calls rent-seeking, right? Efforts by different players to powerful players uh, to control policy in uh, the direction that benefits them rather than uh, the general public. And this rent-seeking uh, creates all kinds of uh, problems. The, the Virginia School uh, and Buchanan and Gordon Tullock, his name needs to be mentioned as well, uh, they argue that uh, this rent-seeking uh, applies across the ideological spectrum. So their argument is, uh, well, it's not just uh, large corporations who are trying to control the reins of government, it's also workers, it's also uh, s students, right, who are, say, demanding uh, relief from student loans and so on and so that they agreed to in, in a contract and so forth. Um, I think that uh, the, the approach of the public choice school, uh, in a sense, there's some overlap uh, between uh, ideas that we find in Marx and the institutionalists in the sense that, you know, big players do try and exercise control. But, you know, Marx and the institutionalists have a, uh, a theory of government. They have a theory of the state, right? And that theory of the state is partly grounded in power differentials and uh, class conflict. Uh, 
and it recognizes that uh, that corporations generally have the upper hand in these kinds of conflicts. Certainly, uh, that idea goes all the way back to Adam Smith, who you know talks about the wage bargain in terms of uh, the balance of power between uh, employers and and workers. Uh, the Virginia School uh, has no theory of the state other than uh, the individuals who work in the state are self-serving. Uh, and uh, therefore are manipulable uh, by uh, uh, big players. I think also that what the Virginia School and Buchanan, their work is grounded in methodological individualism. Everything needs to be explained in terms of uh, the self-interested choices of, of individuals. And what they leave out of the picture is the fact that individuals are socialized. They're, you know, their motives, their behavior patterns, uh, their sense of right and wrong, uh, their values are all shaped by the, the social context and the economic circumstances uh, in which they exist. Um, and because everything needs to be for uh, the Virginia School and the Buchanan approach has to be understood in terms of the choices that individuals make. There is no scope for uh, the formation of values and the formation of, of norms. Their literature often will make references on the side to the fact that, yes, there are norms, uh, but when they start talking about policy questions, they go back to this reductionist approach in which it is the self-serving, self-seeking, self-interested uh, individual who uh, uh, drives what happens. Uh, and uh, that generally leads to problems uh, when they are in positions of power in, in government. They are able to exert coercive control over the rest of us. And that is uh, almost always, in their view, inefficient and almost always, uh, in their view, unjust because it's, just a, it's an infringement of individual liberty. I think the, the, the principal danger of this approach is that it loses sight of the fact that uh, there are dysfunctions in the market that can only be corrected by uh, some kind of uh, collective uh, uh, process uh, involving uh, regulation and um, setting of institutional um, constraints. I studied at NYU and among my teachers were several Austrian school professors who I had enormous respect for. And one of the things I learned from them uh, was to always be mindful of uh, unintended consequences, right? So economists talk about the law of unintended consequences. Um, and I have to say that I think that is a very sharp idea. You know, if I was in charge of anything, I would want somebody next to me saying, you know, if you do that, this might happen and things might turn out, not turn out the way you expect them to. So that is, I think, should be a part of the, the way that anyone goes into a policy making discussion, right? The fact that, you know, human beings react to policies uh, in ways that you cannot fully predict. And that could lead to uh, uh, unfortunate consequences that you did not anticipate. What that view overlooks is the fact that all human activity has unintended consequences. Not just the activity of the government, but also the activity of uh, the private sector, the corporations. There is no reason, there is no good reason to think that uh, the market will uh, eventually correct those unintended consequences. We know that the market can sometimes exacerbate 
problematic circumstances, as when you get uh, real estate bubbles and other kinds of dysfunctions in, in financial markets.